in a changing world. You know, the last three months or so, it seems like, well, it doesn't seem like, everything's changed. I mean, literally. Uh, three months ago, I was trying to think exactly when it was. I can't hardly remember, but the last time that I preached when we were all assembled together, I preached the next to the last lesson in a series on the Acts of New Testament worship. I have one lesson uh, still to preach to complete that series. I can't remember if I preached on Sunday morning or if it was Sunday night, and then we had our Wednesday night activities. And then thanks to the coronavirus, when the next Sunday rolled around, Sunday services did not. Uh, at least not uh, in the usual sense. Ever since then, we've been meeting virtually as we have been maintaining separation. I mean, just a few months ago, if you think about it, the kids were in school. Uh, the economy was rolling. The stock market was up. Uh, NCAA, NCAA basketball professional sports were in full swing. And of course, you'd get toilet paper anywhere. <laughs> but the events of the last couple of months confirm that Henry David Thoreau's statement was right. Nothing endures but change. That's really all that endures. Change is the constant of the human experience. And it's against that backdrop, the backdrop of constant, continual change that the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 13 and verse 8 that our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In less than 10 words, if you think about it, the inspired writer here speaks of what we call the immutability of God. And that's just simply a theological term that refers to uh, the unchangeableness of Christ, the unchangeableness of God. In less than 10 words here, we read about the only real constant in all of our human experience, that God does not change. In less than 10 words, we see what the theologian A.W. Pink described when he said these words are a most glorious message which is designed to set the hearts of God's children at perfect rest allay their fears, strengthen their faith, and to cause them to look forward to the future with confidence. And that is so true. For man, change is inevitable. It's coming. But God cannot change. For God, change is impossible. He cannot change. And there's a number of things here in Hebrews chapter 13 that I want to point out to you that relates to all of this. We won't take time to read all the verses together because we'll look at them separately as we make our way through. And the first thing that I want you to see this morning is that uh, there will never be a change in God's character. God's character is never going to change and that's very clearly pointed out to us here in verse 8 again where the Hebrew writer says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, Jesus Christ in the flesh is the perfect representation of God. He is the express image of God. And so the Hebrew writer is saying that everything that there is to know about God can be seen in Jesus Christ. And if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then that's also true about God, our Heavenly Father. And what the Bible teaches from cover to cover is that God has never had any alterations or additions or amendments to his being at the very essence of who he is. He does not change. He has always been what he is and he always will be what he is. One true, the one true and living God has never had a variation or a vacillation. There's no turning with him. Jehovah God has never known an increase or an improvement because he never changes. Everything that God ever was, he still is today. Everything he is now, he always was that and he always will be that. Now immutability is the fundamental, fundamental characteristic then 
of God, and it's one of the pillars of biblical theology. You cannot rightly divide the word of truth and come to understand the God of heaven as being changeable. He does not and cannot change. Now, common sense tells us that this is true, that a perfect God cannot change. Uh, I mean, he cannot change for the better, right? Because if he changed for the better, that would mean that he was uh, in a position to improve. That would mean that he was not previously perfect, nor was he absolutely holy. If there was just one little bit of improvement that God could make, uh, then he's not all that he claims to be. And on the other hand, God cannot change for the worse. You cannot, uh, you cannot decrease him in any way because if you did, then he would not be perfectly holy, right? He would not be the holy God that the Bible declares him to be. So God never improves and God never deteriorates. God never is to uh, be made better or worse. But we're not left to common sense uh, when it comes to understanding this about God. We have the scripture, and the Bible tells us plainly in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, he said, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I change not. In James chapter 1 and verse 17, speaking of him, he said that in God there is no variation or shifting shadow. What that means is that God never turns. He's always the same. Eternally, he is unchangeable. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, do you remember what the Lord said to Moses from the burning bush? He said, I am who I am. That is the great unchanging constant with regards to deity. I am who I am. That's to say, I am who I was. I am who I am. I will be who I am forevermore. In Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27, the psalmist speaking of God said, Of old you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you will endure. All of them will bear out, wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them, and they will be changed, but you are the same. He's not simply saying that God will exist forever. He's saying that God will exist forever in the very same state that he's always been absolutely perfect. God's in the changing business. He changes the world. He changes you and me, but he himself never changes. He said, you are the same and your years will not come to an end. Now, Hebrews applies all of that to Jesus Christ. And this also disproves one of the basic tenets of a major uh, popular false notion today especially in denominationalism, namely that you can become a god. This little god idea, I don't know if you've been watching preachers on TV, but they talk about it a lot these days. And the idea is that when you get saved, you become a little god. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Because if you could even become just a little god, then you could name it and claim it. You could change your own circumstances. You could make your world the way that you want it to be. And that's what people's after. And so uh, a number of charismatic TV preachers have begun to promote this little God doctrine. And uh, one thing that you can be sure of with regards to this idea and others um, that are based in the teaching of men is that they, they lack the sufficiency of Scripture and they will soon succumb to the fad fads that they actually are. These things come and they go, but the truth stands forever. Now, it's become fa fashionable to teach that when you get saved, you become a little God, that you become more in control of your own life and the circumstances of your own life, and you can determine for yourself, because you are now a God, how your life's going to run, but not to be unkind, I want to say that notion is foreign to the scripture. And it's completely incompatible with the, with the character of God. In order to become a God, you would have to undergo a sudden and dramatic uh, change, thereby instantly qualifying you uh, to be a God, which is absolutely contradictory to the basic definition of God, that he is eternally unchangeable. When you get saved, you don't become a God. Right. Not even a little God. 
Amen. Not even an itsy bitsy teeny weeny God. Mm -hmm. Turning again to the words of A.W. Pink, and I really like what he has to say here. God has neither evolved, therefore we could never be a God because we would have to evolve to that. Uh, God never evolved, therefore we can never be a God. He said, God has neither evolved, grown, or improved. He cannot change for the better, for he is already perfect. Being perfect, he cannot change for the worse. Altogether unaffected by anything outside of himself, improvement or deterioration is absolutely impossible. That's a fact when it comes to the scripture. God does not change. In his basic makeup, who he is, in his character, he remains the same. Now that's number one. Now here's number two. There will never be a time when God's commands will change. If God's nature doesn't change, then God's commands will never change. If God ever said anything, and it was true, you can mark it down. He will never change his mind about that. Now, these verses here in Hebrews chapter 8 record just a few of God's commandments about sin and their consequences. And I want you to appreciate the fact that what the Hebrew writer is saying here is in the immediate context of this great declaration about the unchangeableness of God. What the Hebrew writer says is that since God doesn't change, neither does his commandments. Uh, look at what he says here beginning in verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now the bottom line here very simply is this. We should never get the idea that God has somehow mellowed out and that he has changed his mind about anything. For him to change his mind about anything that he's ever said would mean that when he said it, he was wrong. <clears throat> or when he said it, it wasn't as good as it could be and needed to be improved. That by definition goes against what the Bible is saying about God. Now, for much of the last 200 years, theological liberals have begun to embrace something called process theology or what we would commonly, commonly refer to as progressive liberalism, but they have embraced this idea that in some ways God is in the process of improving. Uh, and so when you, when you listen to preachers on TV or you go to assemblies of some religious groups and you hear preachers preaching, you have to wonder, what Bible are you reading from? What God are you talking about? Because they're all talking about a God that changes his mind. Have you not noticed that? Whatever you might call this, this movement theologically, what's happening all across the country and around the world is that people think that God is changing his mind about some things. Things that he previously said, he doesn't no longer see it that way. Now, if you doubt that that's true, just take, for instance, homosexuality. Some people think that God was once against homosexuality and, and that was because he had adapted to the bigoted culture of Abraham's day. But today, though, God understands gay marriage, that that's a civil rights issue. And as New Testament believers, we should be very careful not to judge lest we be judged. Now, how much do you hear that kind of thing? in religious teaching today. It's become very common. And when people say those kinds of things, what they're saying in essence is that God's changed his mind and somehow God has improved. At least he's improved in their estimation because now they've got him saying what they want him to say. Mm -hmm. He used to be against adultery, but that was because uh, he adapted to the patriarchal male chauvinist views of Nathan's day when Nathan the prophet came and directly confronted David for having taken another man's wife. But today, however, God gives peace to people who are breaking their vows because after all, all God wants for anyone is for them to be happy. So God's changed his mind about that. 
or at least some say that he has. He used to be in favor of justified righteous war, but that's only because he had adapted somehow to the material, uh, militaristic patronism of David's day. But somehow now God is, uh, he's burned his draft card, you, you would think, and he is standing in protest, protest against uh, nationalistic military buildup of sovereign nations. And I understand that there's a difference, obviously, in the New Testament about the way God distinguishes between the call of individuals seeking their own justice and in the way that God has uh, authorized governments to punish evildoers. I understand that we're not to take justice into our own hands, but there is a sense in which God has ordained the government powers that be, and he's done that for the purpose of making peace, promoting justice, and punishing evildoers. But somehow some people have gotten this idea that God's changed his mind about all that. God used to be in favor of governments enacting, uh, setting forth the death penalty. Uh, but in the minds of some, that was only because God had adapted to the totalitarian totalitarianism of Moses' day, but God doesn't any longer see the distinction between individual uh, vigilantes and governments, and he's come of age, and he now favors uh, life with parole, even for those who are serial rapists and murderers. I don't know what Bible these people are reading from who say these kinds of things, but they're saying it a lot more. I don't know where what God they're talking about, but obviously it's a God that changes. Now let me tell you something. I say this respectfully, not wanting to hurt your feelings. But if your God changes his mind about anything he's ever said, he is not the God of the Bible. Amen. He's not the God of uh, the creation that we read about on the pages of Scripture. God used to be against premarital sex, but that was before the sexual revolution. I mean, God, I don't know, maybe he read the Kinsey Report or he read... Uh, uh, Masters and Johnson, and he realized somehow that his prohibitions were inhibiting people from being all that he actually had created them to be, and faced with such a di uh, divine dilemma, God has relented, and now uh, instead of flee fornication, it's just do whatever feels good. Just do whatever you want to do. Some would have us to think along these lines that we have not changed our views on sexual immorality it is actually that God has seen the error of his oppressive ways and has changed his mind. You guys see where I'm going with this line of reasoning. God used to oppose the killing of innocent life. God used to oppose the killing of babies. In fact, uh, God uh, destroyed the Ammonites for that reason. But some think that God has improved that he's changed his mind about that. I don't know, maybe he read the U.S. Constitution. He found something there among the amendments. And he's become enlightened in these modern times um, as we now are becoming more and more familiar with constitutional law. And God is now, he's still perhaps personally opposed to killing babies, but he just wonders if it's really his place to step in and tell someone else what they should or should not do. That's the position that we put God in. We think somehow he takes a second seat to the, to the Constitution or to our ways of thinking. God used to believe that wine was a mocker and that strong drink was a brawler. In fact, instructs us not even to look at it, much less to consume it. But I guess some Sunday afternoon while he was watching a football game, he saw some of those hilarious commercials about beer and was convinced that, well, he just needs to lighten up on this whole issue of alcohol. And some would have it be that God's big issue now with alcohol is just whether or not it tastes great or is less filling. I want to tell you something. God has not changed in His fundamental character. Therefore, His commandments cannot change. If what God said in the past on these and other issues was right and true in keeping with His nature, then they are always true. And God is not, and He will not, ever change His mind. That's right. Because if he does change his mind, that implies that he had some room for improvement, that he was not in the past perfect, and somehow has 
has grown into uh, something more or something better. That God shouts about some sins while he whispers about others, but it really doesn't make any difference. If you're God, if he whispers about certain sins when he shouted about them in the past, then that is a mutable God. He is a changing God, and he is not the God of the Scripture. Now let me give you some verses that uh, speak strongly about this idea of God's commandments or His Word never changing. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, through John the Apostle, uh, here are these words, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. You notice what John's saying? He's talking about this book. Now this book is the, the book of Revelation as we now know it. What John is saying is don't ever add anything to this book. Don't ever take anything away from this book. Right. What he's saying is that this book is perfect. It's just as God wants it. Don't mess with it in any way. And we've had this book for about 2,000 years. And we're warned that if we should add to it or take away from it, that, that there are some heavy-duty consequences for that. And the same thing that's true about the book of Revelation is true about all of the canon of Holy Scripture. Every book is the same. In fact, we find this language throughout the Scripture. In Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, um, the Bible says every word of God proves true. That is, then and now. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. Now, everyone that tries to change the word of God is found a liar because everything that God has ever said is true. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible says you shall not add to the word I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of, your, of the Lord your God that I command you. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. In Matthew 24 verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That is, the word that Jesus spoke 2,000 years ago will stand, it is standing, and will continue to stand until the world is over. Until there's no more uh, time left here on earth. The Lord's word 2,000 years ago still stands and forever will stand. In Numbers 23, 19, the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Those are rhetorical questions. Well, of course, of course, if he said it, he will do it. And if he's spoken it, uh, it will be fulfilled. Because God's word is the truth, and it never changes. I love this translation of Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. What that's saying is that God never needs to change his mind. And I do quite a bit. Because uh, me and God's not the same. I'm imperfect. Big time. I'm a major big imperfection. Now I have the, I have the capacity to, to improve. Hopefully I am improving. But I also have the capacity to change for the worst. Hopefully I'm learning and growing and improving and becoming better. And every time I may become a little better, I'm still not perfect. So I need to repent often about the things I think, the things I say, the things I do. But God's not like a man that he would ever need to repent about anything that he's ever said. He's never going to change in his character. And he's never going to change his mind about his commands. Mark it down. Amen. This is the reason why here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 9, the Hebrew writer goes on to say, Do not be led away then by thy diverse and strange, uh, by diverse and strange teachings. Now when the Hebrew writer is referring to diverse and strange teachings, he's talking about anything other than what we have been given through Jesus Christ. That would be considered diverse or strange. The Hebrew writer says, don't be led away by that. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
He's never going to change in his character. His commandments are never going to change. Stay with him. That's what he's saying. If you go back to the very opening statement of the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, he says that in times past God spoke to the fathers by the prophets in various ways, but in these last days, and that's the Christian dispensation that will go all the way to the judgment, in these last days God is speaking to us through his Son whom he hath appointed heir of all things. And then in chapter 2 he says, he says, uh, let us pay more careful attention to the things that we've heard lest we drift away. And then he says, we first heard the Lord speak these words and they were confirmed unto us by those that heard him. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 he goes on to talk about how God's word is like a double-edged sword. It's quick and powerful and it divides uh, asunder the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. Uh, the word of God the word that God has given will never change. And that's the warning that the Hebrew writer was giving to his audience 2,000 years ago. And that's the warning that we need, especially in this progressive, liberal, religious environment that we find ourselves in. Everything is changing. Everything is changing, will continue to change, but God doesn't change. Now here's the third thing. Now you may think that all of that's negative, but that's all very positive, I guarantee you. The fact that God doesn't change, but it does get a little bit more encouraging for us with the next couple of points. Since God's character never changed and since his commandments never change, there will never be a change in the comfort that he provides us. Now look here at verse 5 and verse 6 again. It says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Now there are two great promises of God in this passage of Scripture, one in verse 5 and one in verse 6. And if you don't understand the unchanging nature of God, this promise might mean very little to you. But if you understand the unchangeable nature of God, then this promise means everything. Now in the Greek... There's a double emphasis here. He himself. Please take note of that. He himself has said. That's a double, a double emphasis. And in the Greek, there's also a double negative. It says, he himself has said, I will never, but in the Greek, it's I will never, never leave you. That's a double, a double negative. There's a preacher, preacher once preaching about the double emphasis and the double negative in the Greek here. And there was an old farmer that came out at the end of the service and he said preacher God he may have to tell you Greek scholars twice but he only has to tell the rest of us once but you know what I have found to be true is that most of us probably need to be told more than once yeah. right yeah. that's why the great doctrines of God are repeated so often in so many ways in the scripture we need to be told uh, more than once and so what God did here is he told us more than once that he's not going to leave us or forsake us. No matter what happens. When friends walk out and trouble walks in, God, he himself has said, I will never, never leave you. When trouble piles up and crisis rolls in, he himself has said, I will never, never leave you. When winds howl and storms blow, he himself has said, I will never never leave you. That's wonderful, isn't it? When the sun is shining or the rain is falling, he himself has said, I will never, never leave you. Whatever comfort that you get, it comes from God because in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says that our God, who is the Father of mercies, is the God of all comfort. All comfort. Not some, but all. Now, you think of a time when you were comforted. You may think, well, I found comfort in my spouse. Well, thank God for that because that's where that came from. You might say, I found comfort in the, the local church among my brethren. Well, thank God for that because that's where that came from. In your distress, perhaps you found comfort. In your time of doubt and uncertainty, you found comfort. Thank God for that because he's the God of all comfort he never changes his character. He never changes his mind. And therefore, every promise that he's ever made just has that much more weight 
God's comfort will never change to those that understand His true nature. That, that's uh, something that we need to absolutely understand. As the hymn writer pointed out, I've seen the lightning flashing, I've heard the thunder roll, i felt sin's breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of my Savior telling me, still to fight on, He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. That's, that's what the Hebrew writer is saying. And we can, we can put our stock in that fully, knowing that God's never going to change who He is. He's never going to change anything He's ever said. You can take what God says to the bank, in other words. In Psalm 23, and verse 4, the psalmist said, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the dark valley of the shadow... He said, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And then he said, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That is, David saying, I found comfort in the dark shadows of life because God was present with me. With his rod and with his staff, he comforted me. And God's done that for me so many times, and I know he has for you. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. We have his comfort. I remember hearing a story one time. It stuck with me. I used it, I think. Um, I think I might have told this story for Elster's funeral. Henry Ward Beecher tells this story about a young boy that was living in Glasgow. He had never been away from home, but he got a job in a neighboring town. It was several miles away. This is back before uh, everybody had automobiles. His family didn't have an automobile and neither did anyone else that they knew. And so he had to walk from Glasgow to that other town to work, and it was far enough away that he needed to stay all week when he got there. So his family took him to this other town to work and uh, helped him get settled in. And the father said to that young boy, he said, son, when you get finished working on Friday, your mother and I are going to be missing you terribly. You've never been away from us. We want you to gather your things quickly and make your way home. Now the thing is, between Glasgow and this other town, there was a deep ravine. And that young boy knew that uh, Friday evening when he got finished working, by the time he made it to the edge of that ravine, it would be dark. And so all week long, he just kept imagining uh, what might be down in that dark, deep ravine, and he dreaded going home so bad. Although he, he, he missed his family and he wanted to see them, he, he thought of how he could get out of going home, but he knew there's no way that I could not go home and disobey my father and break my mother's heart. I, I need to go. And so Friday when he got done working, he gathered up his things. He tried to rush out to the ravine before it got, got dark, but when he got there, it was dark. He said he stood there shaking, looking down into that dark ravine, not knowing what was down in there, dreading so much to walk down into it. And then he said all of a sudden he heard footsteps coming up out of the darkness. And then he saw the, uh, the best thing he'd ever seen. His father appeared out of the darkness. And his dad knew that he was going to be scared. He never admitted that to his son. But uh, he said, son, we were missing you so much, we decided to just come out and meet you and walk with you on the way home. And that boy said that he walked down shoulder to shoulder into that dark valley, that dark ravine with his daddy, and he was not afraid. That's what David is saying in Psalm 23 because of the unchangeable nature of God and all of his promises that can never change. He's saying in the dark shadows, God is with me. Therefore, I was not afraid. You see, God does not change. He never will change. Robert Louis Stevenson was a great author of books like Treasure Island and Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. As a little boy, he took a voyage on the ocean with his father and they encountered a great storm. The father went up to the wheelhouse of that uh, ship and he saw the captain there. He was very calm and collected and confident. He went back down below and he comforted his young son. He said, the captain is at the wheel and he knows the storm better than we do and he is at perfect peace as should we be. And they were. Well, if the captain's not upset, the one who knows the situation better than we do, why should we be upset? That's the confidence that the Hebrew writer is sharing with these Christians who are being tempted to turn away from Christ and from His teaching. He's saying, don't do that. 
God has never changed in His nature and He's never changed His mind and therefore there's comfort in Him. And then here's this one last thing. There will never be a change in God's capacity. Uh, that brings us back again to verse 6. So we can confidently say, I mean, we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, therefore I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, you, the older I get, I don't know about you, uh, there's stuff that I can't do as well as I used to be able to do. In some ways, I can still do everything I used to be able to do. I just can't do it as much at one time uh, as I could before without having to uh, take a rest. But you see, God, God never has ever had that experience and never will even though he's literally older than dirt I mean God is older than dirt literally his eyes never dimmed and his strength is never abated and his arm is never weakened almighty God anything that God has ever been able to do he can still do it Anything that he's ever done, he can still do it because he's still God. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, the apostle Paul says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. This is the God that raised his son from the dead. This is the God that with his words spoke the world into existence. This is the God that controls your life and your circumstances. There is not anything that uh, he is unable to do, not anything that we could ever ask or even think. In Job 42, verse 2, the Bible says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. In Genesis 18, verse 14, you remember when God had made a promise to Abraham and Sarah about them having a son, and they were both old, and uh, Sarah, in fact, laughed when she had overheard uh, the news of this. In Exodus, or Genesis 18, verse 14, the Bible says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Again, that's a rhetorical question. No, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. His capacity is never diminished. Now, we have limited capacity. I mean, we just can't do it all, be it all, say it all, fix it all, solve it all. But God can. He can. I mean, with just the little movement of His finger, his little pinky finger, he can do anything that uh, he wants to do. And so God is the same today that he ever was, and he will always be the same. He's still the same Lord that healed the man with a withered hand, the one that raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, the one that cleansed the leper. Has he changed? No, he has not. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything about what God will choose to do or not do with his undiminished capacity. I'm just saying he can do anything he wants to do. He's still the same Christ who claimed calmed the raging sea, uh, supplied uh, lunch to a multitude with just a small amount of provisions. He hung between the heavens and the earth to redeem wicked sinners and got up on the third day alive, the first fruits uh, among the dead, and will never die again. From age to age and from everlasting to everlasting, Jesus Christ is the same. He will never change. The same Lord that was the shepherd for David will still enable you to lie down in green pastures and he'll lead you beside still waters. The same Lord that was a refuge and a strength for Hezekiah will be a place for you to run and hide. The same Lord that turned a jar of oil into a family oil business nearly to meet every need that you have in some way or another according to his vast riches and glory. The same Lord that freed the demonic of Gadara can bring you liberty and freedom from sin. The same Lord that said peace be still can calm the storms of your life today. The same Lord that forgave the repentant thief and took him to paradise and washes the sins of those that submit to him in repentance and baptism today uh, can still take people to heaven and will take people to heaven. To do that. And so since the dawn of time, God has been changing hearts and transforming lives and restoring marriages and saving souls, and He's still doing it. And will continue to do it until there is no more time here uh, in this world. So we're talking about an unchanging God in an ever-changing world. 
It's good to know, isn't it? Amen. God doesn't change. Right. And I want to end this morning by saying, uh, based on everything that we've looked at here, that God has a plan to save people from their sins. And that plan hasn't changed. Uh, that has tried to change a lot of the moral teachings of God. They're also trying to change God's plan for salvation. Uh, but the fact still remains that Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that's not ever going to change. The fact remains that the apostles going forth to carry out the Great Commission told people to repent of their sins and to be baptized for the remission of sins. And Luke records that the Lord added those who've done so to the church. That's not going to ever change. The faith doctrine is never going to take the place of true doctrine. The sinner's prayer is never going to take the place of Jesus' great commission. Uh, the same way that people have found forgiveness under the authority and teaching of Christ and the apostles will find forgiveness still and in no other way. And it's also true that if you're an erring child of God, uh, you can come home just whenever you want to. God takes God takes His children who run away from home back. Those that are willing to come back, those that will repent, those who see their need of this unchanging God and His unchanging Word and His unchanging comfort and His unchanging capacity, anytime you get ready, you can turn from your sin and come home. And you, you do that by repenting and seeking God's forgiveness. And that's good news. Right. That's never going to change. Now, if that did change, if God's plan to save men or to save every Christians changed, we'd never know. We'd never be able to know, would we, what exactly uh, God does expect or what God would accept. But the fact that He's never going to change His mind about it leaves it uh, out of our hands to determine. We simply have to take Him at His word and be willing to do as he has commanded. If you're here this morning and you're in need of becoming a Christian through repentance and baptism, we have a baptistry here that's full of water and we can baptize you into Christ today. Your sins will be washed. Your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you can go away from this place rejoicing that you found salvation in Christ. If you're an erring child of God, repent of that. And we'll pray with you for you that you might have God's forgiveness. While we uh, stand to sing, uh, well, sit and sing. Uh, if you'll let us know, we'll help you in whatever way we can. You've got your big book. It'll be 326. We're going to be singing Trust and Obey. Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light
Till we 